For all the kinematics that you guys have been working on, it's all classified as one-dimensional kinematics. Um, you know, the cars going down the street, or things falling, and a whole bunch of stuff. It's all classified as one-dimensional kinematics. And now we're going to start looking at what is called uh, two-dimensional kinematics. And the more common word for two-dimensional kinematics is projectiles. So you guys are going to start looking at uh, projectile motion. Now, projectile motion is actually... Very, very, very similar to all the motions you guys have done before, um, except for different things are happening in different dimensions simultaneously. Now, probably one of the easiest ways to get into this is just to go to a little simulation here and show some projectile stuff, and we can sort of see what's going on. So we have just like a really common, simple little uh, projectile simulation type thing. And uh, I got a little cannon 12 meters off the ground. And we're going to start with this is one of the more fundamental, good beginning type of projectile situations. Uh, so we're just going to fire the cannon here. For, let's see if it'll work. Fire the cannon. Come on, cannon. Fire. There we go. And when we fire the cannon, there comes a little cannonball, and there's even a couple of vectors on there and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm going to erase that and do it again. And here comes the cannonball. There we go. And this is slow motion right now. We can erase it again. I can even get rid of the vectors for now. Um, this is normal speed. That's it, normal speed, something like that. It hits a little target, get a couple stars. Anyway, so just projectile motion. Now, you can see it's a little bit different than the other motion you guys have done before, and just the shape of the path. Every shape you've done previously has been straight lines. And straight lines are going sideways, up, down, and angle. They're always straight lines. This one, we have a curve going on. And that's what actually makes it two-dimensional motion. Okay? So I want to go back to the other thing for just a second, and we'll come back to this. Um, the difference between two-dimensional and one-dimensional motion, even though like when you guys did your basic kinematics, you are doing things in two dimensions. For example, you know, if you had something like this, um, you know, something's moving like this, and this is the acceleration. And you might say, well, there's acceleration sideways, there's acceleration up and down. Um, that's two dimensions. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's sort of going in two dimensions, but what's different about stuff like this and sort of like one dimensional kinematics, um, what's different about that is you actually have the same thing in each, whatever, let's call it x, y dimension, okay? So here you've got an acceleration in the x, here you have an acceleration in the y. You have the same thing occurring in the x direction and in the y direction, and that's what makes it one dimensional. You have the same thing occurring in both dimensions. So let's go back to a little simulation thing so I can sort of show you the, the sort of the difference between that and, um, two-dimensional kinematics. So for this one here, uh, let's go fire the cannon again and get thing going. All right, so there goes the cannonball. What we have going on in the two dimensions is not the same. Now to sort of show that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slow it down, I'm gonna erase this, I'm gonna bring those vectors back. And it shows the X vector and a Y vector. And I'm gonna sort of, uh, there you go. So I just shot the cannonball and I've paused it here. And we've got two vectors. You got the big, the big green vector going towards the right, that's the velocity sideways, and we've got a little tiny velocity going down. And as we move forward, if you sort of notice, the vector going sideways never changes. The, v, or the speed, velocity, whatever you want to call it, going sideways never changes, where the vertical one has got larger and larger and larger. And this is one of the keys that makes this two-dimensional motion the V going sideways stays the same. It's a constant V, where the vertical one is changing. We have a changing V. So sideways, we've got a constant V with no acceleration, and vertically, we have a changing V because of acceleration. Of course, the acceleration going up and down, is, of course, is good old-fashioned gravity. Okay? So let's go back to this and what actually makes it uh, two-dimensional motion. For two-dimensional kinematics, okay, we have different we have different motions going on. In the x direction, we have a nice constant v. And the y direction, we have 
an acceleration, of course, this is due to gravity. And that's what makes it to, not that you're moving in two dimensions, but what is occurring in those two dimensions is different. In one dimensional, you know, get the acceleration, you're accelerating sideways and up and down. This could even be a, you know, a velocity vector. Fine. Well, there'd be velocity in the X, there'd be velocity in the Y. You guys found that type of stuff last year all the time. It wouldn't be only one or the other. In two dimensions, you have different motions. You have one is constant in the X direction for constant V, and then in the Y direction, you've got an acceleration. So that's sort of the key difference between um, one-dimensional kinematics and two-dimensional kinematics. Now, because of this difference, you know, here we have constant V, and we've got an acceleration. Since we've got two different types of things going on, one of the key things, one of the little things to star when you're doing two-dimensional kinematics is you want to try and keep X and Y quantities separate. Okay, so you generally don't mix the two things together. The acceleration in the Y has nothing to do with the X, and the speed in the X has nothing to do with the speed gain or loss in the Y. You sort of try and keep the two sets of quantities separate from each other, and that's one of the keys for projectile motion. So if I go back to the little simulation thing again, there we go. Let's uh, erase that. So erase, and we'll shoot again. Oh. There we go. Come on, there you go. You can see that the, the V in the X direction never changes, and the V in the Y direction gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so you're going to try and keep the two separate from each other, get two different motions. Well, if those two things are actually separate and we're not supposed to mix them together, what does that X V have to do with the Y V? Well, in reality, it's nothing. How fast we actually shoot it sideways has nothing to do with what's happening vertical because the vertical part is all being controlled by gravity. Okay, so we want to keep those two things separate from each other. One's an acceleration due to gravity, and the other one is a nice constant V going sideways. All right, and that's the basic idea behind projectiles. Now, there is something that sort of does tie the two things together. So let's go back to their screen. There you go. You want to try and keep the X and Y quantities separate from each other. I'm going to try and draw a little uh, thing I'm going to do over here. Um, for the uh, X direction, we've got a we've got a constant V constant velocity. And that's for the I'm going to make that little bubble extra wide. That is for my X direction. And at the same time, I'm going to overlap my bubbles, do this as best I can. For my Y, I have got a constant acceleration. And of course, we're not worried about drag or air resistance. It's nice and ideal. But there is one thing that ties them together because it's the one quantity that's really important that really doesn't have, it, it direction doesn't matter. So it's not the velocities, it's not the accelerations. The one quantity that ties them together is time. Time is the one quantity that ties them together because time is a scalar quantity. It doesn't care which way you are going. And if you go back to that simulation again, the time it travels sideways and the time it travels up and down has to be the same. So time is the one quantity that sort of ties the two things together. So often what you'll do is you'll solve for um, sideways type stuff and then connect it to the up and down stuff by using time or vice versa. So we want to try and keep what's going on in the X and Y quantity. We want to try and keep them separate, but time is often used to bind them together because, of course, time is a scalar quantity, so it doesn't really make that much difference in terms of what's going on. Okay, so that's the basic fundamental idea behind the difference between one-dimensional and two-dimensional kinematics. And when you do projectiles or two-dimensional kinematics, try and keep your X and Y stuff separate from each other, except bind them together with the time. And one of the best ways to actually learn how to do this is to just start doing it. And the great thing is there's no new equations, there's no new quantities, there's no nothing really new. It's just a different application of the kinematics that you guys already know. So I often like to categorize my uh, projectile motion into three main categories or types of question. And of course, we're just going to start with 
uh, a type one projectile. And for type one projectile, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, the initial height is not equal to zero and V, uh, well, let's do it the other way. Let's do it the other way to make it a little better. Uh, the initial angle is equal to zero. Now that may seem fancy schmancy and complicated, but it's not. It is literally this, where you start off the ground and then you shoot sideways or you go sideways. That's what I like to call a type one projectile because it's the easiest of all the different types. And this is basic type one, okay? So we're starting off the ground and shooting sideways, okay? And that's basically it. So for a type one, it's really simple. And let's do a little sketch here. Got something like this. And all you're really doing is you are going sideways straight off and it of course will curve down like this. And it's actually a parabola is what the actual shape of course would be, which I'm sure some of you guys would recognize, no problem. Okay, so that's the type of thing that is a type one projectile question. Now there's certain quantities that kick in with this type of stuff. Um, for example, we will talk about different things, you know, like the, the initial V. Okay, so there's an initial V at the very, very beginning, or initial velocity, initial speed, and of course there is often a final V at the end because of course it speeds up before it hits the ground. There's also some other things you might be interested in is the height. So we have like how high up it started. So stuff like this. We've also got that distance from that goes sideways. It's got a vertical distance, uh, but there's also the horizontal distance. And that distance in the X direction has its own special name. Uh, I mean, this distance in the Y direction, we just call that height because, it, I mean, duh, it's so much easier. Uh, the distance in the X direction actually has its own name that you guys have used for a long time that you maybe not recognize with this type of thing, but it's really simple. Um, that's what's called the range. The distance you go in the X direction is called the range, which is symbolized with a capital R. Now, you use this all the time. I mean, when you practice golf, you go to a driving range. If you shoot guns, you go to a shooting range. Uh, if you shoot something or throw something and you can't get it, it was out of range. And that's why the term is used because that's what that distance is called. Now, for mathy type people, it throws them off a little bit because when they think about range, they think about the vertical part on a graph, like domain and range type thing. Uh, but this is this is just different. This is something else. So that's generally what we're looking at. And so we've got stuff going on in the X, and we've got stuff going on in the Y, and we're trying to keep those two things separate, but of course we'll try and bind them with time. So even if we just did something simple, for example, you know, in the if we looked at what's happening in the in the X direction, uh, for example, there's a speed in the X direction, and in this case, it's going to be equal to the initial speed because that's all we have. This one right here in a type one, that is our V in the X. Remember that X V never changes. If we go back to that simulation thing, and we shoot again, that X velocity vector, it never changes. It's always the same. But of course, the V Y one actually starts at zero and it keeps on getting bigger and bigger as it goes further down. Okay. So in the x direction, we've got the vx, in this case, in the circumstance, the setup, that's equal to vi. We've also got the distance in the x, which is what we call the range, and that's pretty much all we have going in the x direction. And in the y direction, we've got, you know, uh, we have a changing vy, and of course, you know, the vy at the top would start at zero, and it goes from zero to to, you know, uh, a final V in the Y direction, you know, we will we'll sort of look at that as well. Um, so that's a little bit different. But we also have the distance in the Y, which of course is just the height. So these are some of the main quantities that we will look at. And of course, time is the one thing that sort of ties those two things together and binds them together. Okay, so that's generally what we're going to look at. And again, one of the best ways to do this is just to start a question and see how it works. Okay, now there's one really important thing about the whole time thing. Time's really important, it binds things together. And we've got to look at something that actually controls the time, dictates the time. So we're going to go back to this right here. Now, if I shoot the cannonball type thing. I'll shoot that again. Shoot. There we go. And it fires off. Let's get rid of the vectors. We don't need the vectors right now. Um, 
actually it's kind of hard to see. It's a little bit small. Um, we'll bring that just so it's easier to see. There we go. Uh, what I can do is I can bring in this little tool that actually will tell me some information about it and I'll crack it out here, tell me something. So what it'll do is it'll give me a couple things, but one thing it tells me is the time it took for it to land. And according to this, it took 1.56 seconds for it to land. Okay, so what if I change this a little bit? I can change my my V, you can't see it in the screen, but I can actually change my, my how fast it's going. So I'm gonna shoot it faster. And if I shoot it faster, um, it's going way over there. And, oh, they're good, landed frame. So if I bring my tool back over here, it took 1.56 seconds to land. Well, if I go to this one over here, oh, you can't really see it, uh, but it's also 1.56. It's out of frame, but it, you can trust me, it's actually reading 1.56, it doesn't make any difference. And if I crank the speed down, maybe something like this, and do the same type of thing, when it lands over here, it is 1.56. There it's 1.56. There it's 1.56. And trust me, it's 1.56 the other one. No matter where I go, I got 1.56. No matter how much I change my initial speed by, it's 1.56. So according to this, 1.56 is how long it takes, and the speed in the X direction means nothing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my initial speed, I'm actually making it zero, and I am just going to let it fall straight down. And if I let it fall straight down, and I check the time, once again, it is 1.56. So this tells me that the time has absolutely nothing to do with my speed in the X direction. So this time that we're talking about has nothing to do with this. This has absolutely no connection to VX. It has no connection to how fast it's going. Because when you're talking about time, you're talking about falling. We're looking at how long it takes to fall. Falling is in the Y direction, which is dictated by acceleration, dictated by gravity. So what you're doing in the X direction means nothing. So it's a lot easier to work with time and think about things just falling instead of doing long paths. So the amount of time it would take to go along this path, all the way along here, would be the same amount of time to drop it straight down. So time is no connection to VX whatsoever. Okay, so it's all actually determined by uh, the height of the object, like how high up it is, and any V in the Y direction that might exist. So it's all dictated by Y stuff. So it's the Y components that typically dictate the time, and but then you can use that time and connect it to X quantities. Okay, so let's just take a little question here. Let's do a little practice here and sort of see how this works. And just work through a question to sort of see how things all tie together. So I'm gonna get rid of all this and we'll just make up a question here and piece some things together. So really simple. Just draw a little cliff, there you go, something like that. Really, really simple, okay. And uh, do something, here we go. Okay. All right, so we got the guy up here, he's got a rock. He's gonna throw the rock, there you go. He's gonna throw the rock and the rock's just gonna do something like this. All right, so let's make up some quantities and see how it all kicks in. Uh, let's say he throws the rock at, uh, eight meters per second, and let's say he is 14 meters off the ground, and let's just solve for some different things. Okay, well, what can I solve for? Now, since time does connect to things, um, it is great if you can get to time uh, as early on as possible, it just often makes things easier. Now, with the eight meters per second, there's not really much I can do with that, but I can do something with that 14. I have the height because I know the amount of time it takes to go like this is the same amount of time as to drop it straight down. Well, I know the distance it's dropping and I know the acceleration due to gravity. I can easily calculate time. This is where one of your little kinematic expressions kicks in. This is where distance is equal to one half AT squared works really, really, really nicely. The distance is the height. Um, the acceleration is gravity. I can solve for the time it takes to drop down that 14 meters. So the time it takes to drop down will be two times the height divided by G and I have to screw it because this is my height and this is my G. So I just gotta switch up my variables and I can calculate how long it took for it to fall down. 
And if I do punch that all out, I uh, don't forget to screw it, I get uh, about 1.69 seconds. So it takes 1.69 seconds to do this, and it would take 1.69 seconds to do that. Okay, so now that I've got the time, there's pretty much nothing I can't really solve for. Um, since I'm talking about going up and down, I can keep working on going up and down. Uh, it is dropping straight down. Uh, you're just doing the same type of thing as dropping a rock straight down 14 meters. Um, so we can look at that type of stuff. But one of the great things, once you have the time, one of the nice ones you can find actually is the range. Now range is the horizontal distance. That's from here to here. Now that's something, that's an X direction thing. Well, this eight, that is my V in the, the X right there. That eight meters per second, that is my V in the X. Well, how do you find distance with a speed that doesn't change. Well, that's just DTV, really simple. The VX doesn't change. If I have the time, I can use DTV in order to figure it out. And I got the time right there. So all I have to do is take my time, multiply it by my VX, basically DTV, and I can calculate the range. So I take my time and I multiply that by eight, I get around 13 and a half meters. So it would have landed 13.5 meters away from the base of the cliff. Okay. So I've got my vertical distance. I've got my horizontal distance. I've got all my Ds. I've got my VX. I've got my time. Um, what about a final V? A final V is another really calm thing to find. Now, the only thing is when it gets to the bottom there, if we go back to that simulation thing again over here. Let's, uh, let's give a little more, uh, let's give it some VX here actually. And we'll clean things up and get rid of this thing here. Now let's just clean things up here a little bit. Um, and I shoot it. There we go. Oops, shot two at once. There we go. Try that. Okay. So I've got my VX, which doesn't change. And I've got my VY, which is changing. And if I would look at any other point, there's a total velocity, which of course is a combination of the two vectors. And that total velocity changes as it keeps going. The VX part doesn't change, but as the VY part continues to increase, it sort of starts bending down more and more and more and more. So in order to find out what the final V would be when it actually hits, I've got the VX that doesn't change, but I need to find out what the VY was or what VY was gained when it fell. And again, I can just go back to the idea of just basic free fall from the edge. It basically did a free fall for 1.69 seconds. So when it's going down here, when it's falling down, there's a change in VY and has nothing to do with VX because they're in different dimensions. So I can find my change in VY by just doing VAT. Gravity is what is accelerating it. It's falling straight down and it falls for 1.69 seconds. So if I just multiply those two, um, I will get about 16.6 meters per second. So if you drop the rock straight off the cliff and it fell and hit the ground, it hit the ground going 16.6. So when I put those two things together, I've got the initial VX that I started with. That's right up here. That VX never changed. I had eight going sideways, which never changed. But now I've got this new one. I've got 16.6 going down which then gives me my overall resultant velocity, which would look something like that. Okay, so it's got to combine the two things together. So, of course, if you want, I would typically um, move this uh, over here. Oh, transparent selection. There you go. That's better. I moved over there. A little bit easier for me to visualize, and it'd be easier to solve the angle and stuff like that. So anyway, so we've got the VX, which never changed. We've got the VY, and it's just a triangle. So your basic uh, triangle stuff kicks in from grade 11 and grade 12, actually. So if we want to find the hypotenuse, we've got that 16.6 for the Y, and then we will add the 8 squared for the X, root it, and we find out our hypotenuse is around... 18.4 so this thing hit going around 18.4 meters per second and then of course we want the angle the angle we'd solve for is right in there so i would probably use tan theta to solve for it or inverse tan theta to solve for it and 
bigger angle. And if we punch up the angle using basic trig, this is like 64 degrees in there. So since this is a downward angle, it's really common to see something like maybe at negative 64 degrees. Okay, and that's the entire situational solved. Now, the cool thing about it, well, physics kind of nerd cool, is if we actually look at it, that's DTV, that's VAT, this is grade 11 vectors. The only thing here that is actually grade 12-ish is that expression right there to solve for the time. Other than that, it's all just an application of basic grade 11 ideas put into two dimensions. That's it. Okay? So, and again, the more you do it, the quicker it's going to get, the easier it's going to get. It's no big deal. Okay? So, let's try another question, get rid of this, and then we'll try another question as well. Okay, so let's try something else here. Let's try uh, this. Here, let's, let's draw some. Let's draw some grass. There we go. And draw a person over here. There we go. That is a giant head. All right. Uh, and just, you know, let's go. Let's, go. let's just have them throw a little uh, little baseball as hard as they can. There we go, something like that. No big deal. Okay, so they throw the baseball and they throw it straight and it's going to travel along something like that. There we go. No big deal. Okay. So let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's say the baseball lands after, uh, let's say 0 0.55 seconds. And let's say it lands 7.2 meters away. Okay, so let's try that. What I want to know, let's see, let's even figure out uh, what was the height over here. I guess we could try that. And yeah, you know, we'll just stick with that for now and we will find something else. Let's start with that though. Okay. So let's look at what I've got. I've got lands after 0.5 seconds or 0.55 seconds and 7.2. Okay, so if I look at my quantities, of course, this is my time. That's 7.2 meters. So it lands 7.2 meters away. Of course, that would be my range. Well, if I've got time and I've got range, there's a couple of things I could actually find. Uh, but right now I'm looking for the height. So to find the height, I would need to know the acceleration, what's well, gravity, and I need to know the time. Well, I've got the time. Okay, so that's not too bad, actually. So the height would just be the 1 half gt squared, which, of course, the 1 half at squared sort of modified. So I've got the 1 half, and I've got the 9.81, and I can multiply that by the 0.55 squared, and that gives me a height of about 1.48 meters. So they were 1.48 meters off the ground when they threw it. Okay, well, how about, let's find another one. I mean, that's the initial height. How about we find what was the initial V? What was the initial V that I was thrown at? Which, of course, would just be, in this case, the VX. So if I want to find the VX... Well, that's where my range could kick in because range and time and V is basically DTV going sideways. If I just do the range divided by the time, that will give me a VX. So I've got that 7.2 and I will just divide that by my uh, 0.55 and apparently they threw it at around 13.1 meters per second and that's it. Okay, it's so not too bad at all. Now, I could, of course, also I could find the final V. So why not find the final V? Let's find that as well. So what is the final velocity? Okay, well, I know my VX doesn't change. Okay, so my VX doesn't change at all. So I've got a VX of 13.1. But I do have a changing VY, which just be acceleration times time. So that would just be a 9.81 times the 0.55, which gives me like 5.4. So I've got a VY around 5.4. And then all I have to do is solve for the hypotenuse, and I'd have my final V. So I got that 5.4, and I'll combine that with a 13.1 to find how fast it's going. And it looks like around 14.2 meters per second. 
I'll then solve that little tiny angle in there. And if I do that, I will get a uh, angle of just not too big, around 22 degrees or so. So that's 22 degrees. So if I put this all together, it looks like my final velocity is going to be 14.2 meters per second at negative 22 degrees. And there you go. There's a little, another little type 1 projectile question uh, solved for. So again, some DTV, some VAT, uh, little vectors. It's just the 1 half AT squared from the big gigantic kinematic question or equation you guys learned this year. It's really the only new little tidbit. It's mostly just about different application. Okay, so that's where all this type of stuff kicks in. Uh, back to the simulation a little bit. Um, you know, we've got this thing taking off. Well, let's get rid of the toilet, let's do the components instead. You know, we've got uh, X motion, we've got Y motion. Those two things come together to make a nice uh, curved path. And of course, what happens in the X direction is totally independent of the Y. We've got constant motion sideways, acceleration going vertically, and they are combined with time. Now, if we want to get a little bit nerdier as well for a little bit here, uh, we can talk about why it is a parabola to begin with. And we can sort of uh, nerd this up a little bit more with that type of math type knowledge. Uh, when you guys have worked with parabolas, let's we'll do this a little quick right here. Um, when you guys have done parabolas, usually, you know, say Y, X graph, you know, you have something like this, or maybe you have it on both sides because you're graphing the Y equals X squared type thing. Well, and that's the same reason as, as why the shape of the projectile is also parabola. Because when you go sideways, it's constant speed, okay, right? It's just uh, moving along, no big deal. You've got, uh, you know, you got like DTV is basically what's happening sideways. But vertically, the distance is one half AT squared. So that's the vertical type stuff. And that's why one part is, um, well, they're both very similar to the y equals x squared type thing. This part here, the distance is going up by a linear fashion, right? The same way your x values go up by constant amounts. But vertically, because you have that squared on there, the vertical part ends up being the product of a square type thing, so it shoots up really big. The same way your y values also shoot up really, really big to give it that whole parabola shape. So it's because you sort of like have a t going one way and a t squared going the other way, um, that gives it the parabola shape. The same way you've got x going one way and then x squared to give you your y going vertically. So it's the same type of thing. Uh, if we sort of adjust the graph a little bit, you know, you have your x values this way, the vertical part is y, but that's actually equal to x squared. The same way in a projectile, what's going sideways is dictated by time, but what's going vertically is dictated by time squared. So that's why we get the parabola shape out of it, the exact same reason in math with the whole parabola type thing, you know, exact same shape, it's all connected mathematically. Okay, but that's just a little nerd touch up right there for you of why the shape exists the way it does. Okay, so projectile motion, not too bad. Uh, really, that there's two more types of setups we'll look at, but it's the same type of calculations over and over again, just different perspectives. Uh, really, DTV, VAT, it's a little bit of vectors, and then that one half AT squared part of the big equation kicks in every now and then. It works really nicely for this type of thing. Okay, but that's basic type one uh, projectiles.